Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Corporate Crime Comics, number one and two. The only two issues of this comic, published by Kitchen Sing Press in 1977, and uh, the second issue was 1979. These uh, two comics were the brainchild of Leonard Reifus, and uh, Leonard Reifus uh, believed that comics could be used uh, to teach people about a lot of things. He published a lot of basically educational comics, but through the underground publishers. So um, his stuff is, a, I don't know, barely underground. It's usually pretty um, tame because it's just trying to, um, you know, teach people things about uh, uh, the environment, uh, politics, and in this case, corporate crime. Let's look at the first issue. We start off here with a wonderful Greg Irons cover of Karen Silkwood. And uh, this came out like seven years before the movie came out with Meryl Streep. Um, but it's a really nice cover. A little less uh, spare. Inside front cover is a kind of comic editorial from Leonard Reifus. Leonard Reifus couldn't really draw very well. And, uh, but he had a good eye for other cartoonists, so he'd draw on his comics, but luckily he got some of the great underground cartoonists to draw a lot of um, comics for his uh, anthologies. I apologize in advance, I'm still um, very sick, but I figured <laughs> I'd try to do one of these. I'm uh, very dopey. So in 1974, Karen Silkwood's car crashed, and we flash back to see what happened. This story is by R. Diggs, um, whose real name was Harry Driggs, but his cartoonist name was R. Diggs. And Karen Silkwood went to work for a nuclear power plant, and there was lots of safety problems at the plant, and she actually got dosed by plutonium a few times. They wouldn't even get her a respirator, so when there was uh, contaminations, like the bell would ring and she didn't even have a mask to put on. So she was contaminated internally. Unfortunately, she didn't even live long enough to develop cancer. She probably would have because she starts, uh, she joins the union trying to push for safety things. Of course, the evil nuclear corporation doesn't like that. She's a she's a whistleblower. She uh, hooks up with the, some government organizations and starts actually like taking files to prove that they're um, you know breaking the laws. And the the so she finally you know she she dies on that road. She her car runs off the road supposedly, but there's a lot of weird stuff. Um, an inspector from the Dallas Accident Reconstruction Lab says it looks like a typical hit and run. So it looks like somebody ran her off the road. The tire tracks, the road was repaved the next day for some reason. And her apartment was, was poisoned, had unusually high uh, levels of plutonium in her apartment. Of course, the, the nuclear uh, spokesman just said, oh, she probably did it herself to embarrass the company, which is ridiculous. And the evidence she had, that was, um, she was driving to meet some reporters that night. The, and she had all these files. That evidence never turned up to this day. We don't know what Karen Silkwood found. What did Karen Silkwood know that we should know too? SR digs at the end. Nice cartooning, pretty crazy story. This is the ITT scandal, story by Leonard Reifus, and beautiful uh, Dick Tracy-like art from Peter Poplaski. Peter Poplaski, we've seen him before in some of the comics. I did a lot of stuff for Kitchen Sink. A really wonderful mimic. He could uh, co copy any cartoonist style. So this looks like uh, some crazy Dick Tracy comic. And this is uh, basically a part of the Watergate thing. Like, one of the things. I mean, Watergate was so many scandals, basically. But this is basically 
ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph, the antitrust uh, guy in the government was go going after them. And all of a sudden, they contributed some money to the Republican National Convention, and the probe went away. So obviously, some shady dealings. But um, we see a lot of crazy, colorful characters during this Nixon administration, and whistleblowers, and... Jack Anderson was a journalist back then. Yeah. Seemed to be an actual real good journalist. And uh, the committee to reelect the president. One day the guy, uh, Magruder, is saying, man, I wish we could get rid of that Jack Anderson. And G. Gordon Liddy was listening and just walked out the door and was planning to kill Jack Anderson. And he's like, oh, my God, get him back here. He's like, Gordon, I was just using a figure of speech. And G. Gordon Liddy just says, when you give me an order like that, I carry it out. Total nut job. So it's just, it's, it's a comedy of errors. It's kind of ludicrous. But of course they got away with it. I really like Peter Poplaski's uh, Dick Tracy, you know, uh, copying. The Great American Airplane Scam of 1973. I don't think this was a big story. I think it was just anecdotal. Trina Robbins, who wrote and drew this story, she had a run-in with this, like, kind of hippie airline that started. And they had organic food in the flight and super low rates. But it turned out, of course, to be all a scam. And all of a sudden, they were just jacking up rates. Like, after people paid for their tickets, they're like, actually, it's not $100 anymore, it's 200 They were canceling flights. It just seems like a big... Uh, it was a big boondoggle. And of course, the guy who uh, started the company, uh, you know, the government finally caught up to him and said, you know, this is fraud. But of course, he's a rich guy, so he got a four-year suspended sentence, which means no jail time. He was supposed to pay back all the money, or the airline was supposed to pay back all the money they ripped off of people. But Trina Robbins says she hasn't received any checks from them ever. So, once again, they just get away with murdering those guys. Here's a little article by Sally Harms. Giant Monopoly steal land and water in California. I mean, this is old news. Uh, they set up this thing to help small farmers. And they also didn't want giant farmers to, you know, have a monopoly. So, the government provided irrigation. But... And, and no farm over 160 acres could apply. And then within months after starting it, these giant agribusinesses that were 20,000 acres or more somehow got this water. And it was just illegal. But of course, money talks and bullshit walks. So they just got away with it forever. And just crazy how it just laws don't apply to certain people in our society, I guess. This is a heartbreaking one, Golden Years by Sharon Rudolph. This is about the um, retirement home industry, how they uh, trick old people. Well, beyond tricking, they actually bully them and harass them and threaten them. People who are totally fine in their own houses, they're doing fine. But they, you know, convince them or bully them or trick them into going to this retirement home where they can drug them at will. They take their home. They get them to sign over their power of attorney and their life savings. And they just do this over and over. And the conditions of these retirement homes are terrible. They're feeding them slop, disgusting food. And this one woman tried to be a whistleblower and uh, she wrote to the governor of Ohio. She said, please help, help these old people. Two, two days later, two policemen showed up, at, showed up and dragged her away to the state mental hospital. She was committed without legal counsel and held for 90 days. And then she was released after 90 days. No treatment or explanation. But the whole thing was it was no longer possible for her to testify against the retirement home, big wig in court. After 90 days, insanity goes on your record. Your testimony will be thrown out. So just this like completely illegal, horrible shit they do. Unfortunately, that old guy we saw earlier, Huggins, he died. 
you know, worn out by poverty and despair. And then this guy just went on to do this again in the South. He moved to Louisiana, uh, Eugene Woods, and just kept doing the scam over and over. And somehow there's no law against it. He's not in jail. Uh, sounds like he was never even suspected or, you know, tried. I like this warning, though. But remember, you're not getting any younger yourself. So this is something we should all care about because one day we'll be John Huggins' age and somebody might pull this shit with us. Uh, here's one of my favorites, Kim Deitch and uh, Mr. San Diego. Now, we see all these typical people in court, in a courtroom. You know, a guy's there for uh, bank robbery, bad check artist extortion, prostitution. And then this guy walks in. He's a big wig. <clears throat> C. Arnold Smith. And this guy fills this guy in on the story. This guy was a huge banker, owned a multinational corporation. Of course, he, uh, as will happen, he started looting one of his companies for like $100 million. And he got away with it forever because he always greased the palms of all the politicians. Even so high, so high up that uh, he was friends with Richard Nixon. So when the IRS and the Attorney General started getting on Smith's case, President Nixon totally put the kibosh on it. He was like, uh, tell that asshole to lay off. So it probably would have worked forever, but, you know, this is post-Watergate. So Nixon couldn't protect him anymore. Now this guy's in, in court. Remember, he basically stole over $100 million. And at the end, the court says, two-year suspended sentence and fine you $30,000. And this guy says, hey, wait a minute, ain't he going with us? And he gets to walk away free. And these people who basically did barely anything... This guy wrote a few bad checks. This guy did rob a bank, but he probably only got a few, you know, a few thousand dollars. They all have to go to jail and watch this billionaire go free. Very typical. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a little article. Um, bad drugs, and uh, but this is nice. We get a nice uh, Justin Greenillo, and. Uh, this is uh, some drug called Mer 29, which was, you know, once again, you've heard this story a million times. It was a bad drug. It hurt people, but it was passed by the FDA. So um, there was one whistleblower who told everyone that during the, there was test monkeys before they approved it. One of them was losing weight and going blind. So our bosses just decided to throw out the sick monkey and substitute another monkey, which had never even been on the drug. So it was just complete bu bullshit, but it still worked. And then, of course, a lot of people were hurt. And uh, whatever. They they did get caught for fraud and fined $80,000. They got sued by a, a bunch of the their customers. But all in all, they still had a huge net worth and net profits. So it's worth it for these guys to, you know, pay a few fines here and there and get away with millions of dollars of fraud. And here's, an, here's an article about a racist TV station. I mean, uh, never heard of this. Like, they would do things like when Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP council, was on in the 60s. When he was on TV, they would just uh, cut the signal and say, sorry, cable trouble. They'd use the N-word a lot. And finally, people complained. They said, this does not represent uh, the viewers. And it worked because technically the FCC... All television stations are there for the people. So if it's not reflecting the viewers or listeners, you know, they uh, they have a right to complain. And this is, uh, this drawing is by Peter Loft. Never heard of him, but it looks pretty good. Here we got the Teapot Dome scandal by Larry Rippey. And, uh, this is mainly about Senator Albert Fall. And he's really good friends with Warren G. Harding, the president. And they were very chummy. And he was, Fall actually convinced, convinces Harding. Doesn't even seem very hard. He just asks him. He says, hey, you know all that uh, oil land that the Navy owns? Uh, 
in the Teapot Dome area, in the Elk Hills, why don't you just sign him over to the Department of Interior, which I run? He just totally he does. And then he sells off his oil drilling rights to a bunch of his friends, his cronies. He gets bribes. He gets kickbacks. It comes out. It becomes a huge scandal. I mean, they totally have him dead to rights. And, uh, so, uh, yep, Fall is convicted, guilty. One year and a hundred dollar fine <laughs> for selling off government land, stealing it, basically. And, uh, working the environment, too. All the bribers were acquitted. None of them even had to see jail. Eventually, the land was returned to the government. And then we see a few of the what happened to a lot of these characters in the Warren G. Harding administration and following that, the Calvin Coolidge. It was a time of great scandals. Here's a story about, uh, this was a game in the, I think the 70s, this guy made an anti-monopoly game. Because all the board games seem to glorify capitalism and monopolies. So he made an anti-monopoly game. And they threatened to sue him, uh, Parker Brothers. But he was like, you know what? I actually know the secret origin of Monopoly. You guys don't even own the copyright. It was made in 1904. It was called The Landlord's Game. This woman invented it. But I, I think she didn't get a hard copyright on it. And it was just uh, a lot of people would play it, kind of spread around. She would just sell them. And uh, people eventually realized they'd rather own the land and become like you know, monopolists and play this game that was actually teaching people about like, yeah, they'll try to screw you over the rich people. And this one guy sells the rights to Parker Brothers. He just pretends he made it up. And over the years, Parker Brothers has lied and uh, tried to erase all knowledge of this previous game. And lucky for the guy who sold them the rights, it behooves them to propagate the myth that he is the sole creator. So he's, a you know, made millions. Not as much as Parker Brothers, but he's done very well. He's had a very uh, wealthy life. And then, so after the, the 70s, the guy has the anti-monopoly name. They take it to court, and the judge rules in Parker Brothers' favor and says, no, they basically own the word monopoly. Even anti-monopoly is too close. So once again, the little guy loses. Another little article about the streetcars, uh, the dismantling of the streetcars by big oil and uh, tire companies and the car companies. They uh, wanted people to buy more cars. And they have kind of did a conspiracy and destroyed 100 rail systems throughout America. Not just uh, Southern California, which had the most. And we get a nice illustration from Jay Kinney great underground cartoonist and uh, this is just so fucking annoying in 1899 Southern Pacific Railroad was irritated by this political cartoonist's uh, editorial cartoons attacking them so they actually went to the government, the state legislator probably bribed some people and made it illegal to publish the offensive cartoons so that lasted for 16 years like, it was basically the freedom of, freedom of press was just thrown out the window just because this railroad, powerful railroad concern, didn't like the political cartoons attacking them. Fucking nuts. Oh, we got a nice Dennis Kitchen hello. Next story is the Ludlow Massacre. And uh, this is by R. Wilson, I believe. Oh, no, this is Leonard Reifus. And uh, this is just a... A very typical story in American history. These miners were trying to unionize. They were treated like shit. Treated like slaves by the company. And of course, the the mining company, which is owned by the Rockefellers, you know, they basically pay off the National Guard. So our taxes are going to this uh, mining company having, having their own private security force. And there was this one horrible massacre where they had these uh, tent camp, the unions, and they just shot it up and burnt every tent to the ground, killing lots of women and children who were living in the tents. 
And then after all that, the strikers were still defeated. So the, the, they won once again. I never heard of this story. It's a mini mata. It's by Greg Irons. Beautiful cartooning by Greg Irons here. And I guess it was a Japanese city after World War II. They built a chemical plant. It was a fishing village. And this chemical plant was just poisoning everything. And all of a sudden this disease started. Uh, this new disease. And uh, at first it only affected small critters. But then people were dropping like flies. And it turned out they did a probe. And it was this chemical uh, plastics company was getting in the fish. People who ate fish had a significantly larger um, chance of getting this disease. So they just totally killed thousands of people. They um, did give some like reparations money or like, a, what do they call it? A consolation payment. They never admitted blame though. Even though every scientist was like, no, this is how this disease started. You guys were pumping this bacteria in or these chemicals in and the bacteria you know, digested it in a certain way that became more and more toxic as it went up the food chain. And even worse, it lasted for, you know, the, the repercussions are still happening because, you know, all, even people who didn't seem affected by the disease, when they had children in the womb, these little children didn't have the defenses and a lot of kids were born with a lot of messed up problems due to this disease. So some people didn't take the consolation payment and they fought back and they took them to court. But I don't think they ever admitted that they were in the wrong. Yeah, terrible. But at least we have a nice Greg Hart story out of it. See, I like to see the bright side of things. Uh, every issue has a bibliography on the inside back cover that's kind of interesting. You can see what... Uh, source material the artists used and here we have a nice back cover by r wilson not familiar with this guy he has a pretty slick style it's demon seed and this is about the Dalkon shield which in the 70s was like killing a bunch of women it was kind of a birth control device that would be put inside women of course it was rushed to the market without enough testing and sure enough started killing women. It was made, something was off on it, a little wrong. And the FDA got a little suspicious. They pulled them from the market and sold them to the third world. Crazy. Okay, let's look at number two. Ah, once again, we have a Dick Tracy homage. And uh, let me get up the list of creators here. Yeah, it is by Peter Poplaski, once again, doing his uh, Great Chester Gould imitation. Corporate crime lineup. Inside uh, front cover, editorial comic by Leonard Reifus again. This is a really interesting story, the, the Onassis plot. I never heard of this. Um, it's also written and drawn by S.B. Whitehead. I think that's Sam B. Whitehead. Never seen this guy. Really slick cartoonist. Um, apparently, uh, it mentioned uh, that he also did work for Bananas, that Scholastic Teen magazine, which is uh, kind of interesting to me. And he did a little work in Undergrounds. And I guess um, Aristotle Onassis, the famous, sh famous shipping magnet in the 70s, made a deal with the Arabs, Saudi Arabian uh, oil guys. And they were going to let him using his ships, 10% um, uh, of the crude oil would be shipped on his tankers. Now, this was a startling change. Aramco, the Arabian American Oil Company, had a total monopoly on this oil shipping for decades. So this was quite a coup. Of course, we're in bed with the Saudi Arabians. America has been for a long, long time, even back in the 50s when the story takes place. And Vice President Richard Nixon calls in these like troubleshooters to take care of this. And of course, well, all of a sudden the smear campaign happens against Aristotle Onassis. And uh, I just wanted to pause for a second. Look how good that young Richard Nixon is. This guy can really draw as some whitehead. 
some really uh, nice nice work. Yeah, it was um, his ships. He had a whaling ship off of Peru that was bombed by Peruvian planes. Even though it was like well outside the 200 mile fishing limit. So it's just crazy stuff happened. America basically just put the, the finger on this guy and all of a sudden everything goes to shit. He finally basically has to give up the whole deal he did. They they got him nailed. He, you know, they've totally made up all Trump made up these Trump charges against him. So he's like, fine, fuck, I'll give up that 10%. And then all of a sudden his problems went away. So it's pretty shitty. I mean, Aristotle Onassis was a pretty rich guy. I'm sure he came out smiling. This is about the Triangle Fire. This was a famous thing in New York City, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Um, I mean, this probably happened every week, but this was the one that was reported on because most of the employees were women. And it was a, you know, seamstress shop. They locked the doors because they didn't want the women to leave early or steal stuff. The The doors all entered inwardly. So if there was like a fire, it would be really hard to get out. The fire escape only went down to the second story. So of course, one day a fire breaks out. Oh, I should mention... They were bribing the fire officials for decades to, you know, let them get away with this shit. And uh, years earlier, they did try to strike. And of course, the police just showed up and beat the shit out of everyone. So the girls, the, the seamstress union, they won some gains from that strike. But not the Triangle Shirt Factory. The guy basically just said, no, nope, I don't care. I'm not going to listen to those... Uh, you know, the gains that you guys got. I'm not going to respect them. So one day a fire breaks out. The manager on duty gets the fire hose. It breaks apart in his hands. It's just rotten. The fire spreads. Some women get out. The people on the top floor, including the big bosses, they get out on the roof. And but the woman in the middle floor, because it was three story, basically three uh, stories of this building, they're fucked because the, they didn't even know there was a fire until it was already out of hand. So this is the tragedy that like people talked about for years. They, they made movies about this, and they were just trapped. All the doors were locked because that fucker had locked them in. So they got to the point where they just had to jump. I mean, they'd, they'd rather have a quick death than die burning to death. So these women were jumping onto the street, one after each other, their hair on fire, their dresses on fire. The weight was too much for the firemen's nets, so they all just plummeted to their death. It was just horrible. The The funeral was like, I don't know, 10,000 people walked through New York City. It was almost like they this was a sacrifice. They Finally, people woke up to how heinous these working conditions were and how something had to be changed. But unfortunately... 150 women or so had to die. Oh, just I saw a TV movie about that when I was a kid. It just seems so unjust. Here's a Sharon Rudall returning for a story about baby formula. How since the baby boom has died, all the big companies that do baby food, like Nestle's, they've been pushing it on the third world. And this has been a really bad thing for people in those countries. First of all, they have to pay to sustain their children. They used to just have, use mother's milk. But these doctors and these nurses who are kind of just shills for the baby food companies, they're paid employees. They convince these women that it's better. It's like, oh, it's the modern way. Here's one, a few cans for free, just like a pusher. They give them a few, uh, the first few are free. But then for six months, these women have to keep buying this shit. When before, all they had to do was just, because you know, once you stop giving milk, it can't come back. So a lot of these women go dry. And then even if they change their minds and say, oh, maybe I can't, shouldn't do this, it's too late. Uh, apparently the the babies who uh, use formula instead of mother's milk, they have like 100% more chance of dying. It just doesn't have the natural immunities that mother's milk has. Just disgusting. We have another R. Diggs story. 
And this is about how UC Davis, a couple of scientists there, saved the tomato. And uh, what they really did was make the tomato very profitable for a handful of huge agribusiness people and put a lot of other people out of work. They basically made this mechanized way to harvest tomatoes. And it was revolutionary as far as how much more tomatoes California could produce in a year. But because of it, basically like, I don't know, like a, a third of the farm workers were laid off. They didn't need them anymore. And uh, I like how our digs tell us in kind of an entertaining way. And a small farmer's like saying, hey, I don't mind that, paying less for workers. And these two uh, scientists were like, oh, wait a second, we got another surprise for you. We've also eliminated 85% of the growers. These machines need big fields. So this method of tomato um, growing, it doesn't really work for little small farmers. It needs giant fields. So these guys, a lot of them that were put out of business and they had to sell their land to giant agri business. And they kept coming up with um, new techniques to fire even more people. Here's a nice uh, one pager by Larry Todd. It's basically just an article in comic form. He just drew, I don't know if that's Mr. Natural in a death shroud. It looks like it could be. And it's just about a, a terrible incesticide called Capone, which um, the plant where it was made had no safety conditions at all. This shit is incredibly toxic. And the workers would just be like, looking like they just came from a, a bakery job. They'd be powdered in it, which is crazy because even getting a little of this in your lungs is dangerous. So of course, like a million times before, the town around it was uh, poisoned. A lot of the workers died. And of course, the guys who owned the factory came out smelling like roses. I like this one. It's uh, Jay Kinney. It is about the advertising industry. Just how the advertising industry basically gets paid to lie. And uh, even when they get caught and the government says, oh, you can't really say that you gotta change your wording. The initial lie sticks in people's head and the initial boost in sales remains. And there's one guy in this professor's class, he's an advertising professor. He keeps pointing out how, yeah, you know what? that ad campaign got shot down too and they found out that they were lying every time he gets up and kind of counter counteracts his professor the professor's really pissed off and uh, he says see here Eddie I don't have I won't have you disrupting the class like this who do you think you are I'm actually agent Z19 from the year 2794 sent back to cleanse the earth of your idiotic capitalist double talk and he zaps the guy to a pile of dust. Mission accomplished and poofs off back to the future. Oh, I like Jake Kenny's stuff. He always makes it entertaining. Excuse me one second. Here we have how the corporation dodged its taxes by Larry Gonick, the cartoon history of uh, the universe guy. Always doing nonfiction. Always doing educational comics, but uh, always fun, you know, because he's got this great cartoony style. He uh, just doesn't just have talking heads, you know, recounting history. He always uh, makes it kind of fun. Big fan of this guy. And this is just, as, you, as the title says, the elaborate plans and schemes that it's all legal. They're not breaking any law, but they figure out these ways where... They don't have to pay any taxes. Little article about Kodak film and their monopolizing ways. Uh, this wheelchair company. Um, this woman who is Ellen Whippenforth draws this. I don't know what else she's done. Dennis Kitchen writes and draws a uh, little article about Topps cards. I didn't know this growing up. Topps was a monopoly. I guess now that I think back, I don't remember any other sports cards. It was all tops. And uh, in the 70s, some other uh, bubblegum companies were trying to make their own cards. And I guess tops was doing some shady stuff to keep them down. 
getting exclusive licenses with the National League. And it's almost like the National League liked it that way. So they were in cahoots with tops to stay a monopoly. But it's just nice getting a couple of Dennis Kitchen illos. This is a weird comic. It's Leonard Reefus wrote it and drew it with Dennis Kitchen's children, who I believe at the time were like, I don't know, six or seven. And this is just about um, dioxin. And there's this town where there's a dioxin spill. The birds fell out of the sky. One man went to pick up his dead cat and the cat's tail fell off. And so they took everyone out of the town and put barbed wire around it, killed all the animals so it couldn't spread. And most of the kids in the town got sick from dioxin. But it's kind of interesting how they got uh, this childlike drawing from actual children. It was a different perspective. I really like the art in this one. It's, um, I, uh, kind of unfamiliar with this guy. And apparently even the, um, comics joint is unfamiliar with this guy. It's uncredited. And it just says unknown contributor. And this is about the Philippines. About how the government's been cracking down on these, uh, the, the natives there. Or a certain sect. The Muslim brothers of uh, the Zamboanga shores. Also talking about how Westinghouse USA was awarded a billion dollar contract to build a nuclear reactor. And just the amounts of graft and bribery that goes along with getting the contract. There's a personal friend of uh, President Marcos there. And uh, his name's Mr. Decini. And this guy made millions off of this shit. He, it's just so corrupt, so like blatant, you know, shit. I gotta find out who this guy is. It's really good stuff. I almost thought it could be Melinda Gibby, but I don't think so. I don't know if it reminds me of her. I like this as they're listing off all the fraudulent things. These rabbits are coming out of an Uncle Sam hat. Because it's almost like they're pulling rabbits out of a hat. How ludicrous this shit is that everyone bought. And of course, this nuclear power reactor didn't have to go through any safety standards comparable to like in the United States. It's, it's right on an earthquake fault. And uh, it's next to two non-extinct volcanoes. So it just seems like, oh man, this is not gonna end well. Here we have the J.P. Stevens story by Larry Ripley once again. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And this is just about this, uh, what are they called? Um, a textile corporation <coughs> that for decades has been just like, no safety standards. If somebody gets his fingers chopped off in a loom, they just fire him. This has been going on for years. But it's just told through uh, Larry Rippey talking to his friend about it. Because he couldn't figure out a way to draw the comic story. So he says, I can't make this comic. And then his friend comes over. And then, of course, he proceeds to make the comic as a kind of an autobio. Him just ranting to his friend. Oh, and once again, we close out with Greg Irons doing genocide. And this takes place in Brazil. Just talking about ever since the Portuguese and the Europeans landed in Brazil, they've been exterminating the, uh, the Indians there. And, and I love how he draws this conquistador so inbred and just like oafish and brutal looking. Looks like an ogre. And some of the uh, Indians were okay for a while because they were so deep in the Amazon, even the, the Europeans couldn't penetrate. But as the years go on and like rubber becomes a big thing in 1900, 1890, 1880, they start going deeper and deeper and fucking with more Indians. And, uh, you know, slavery, just massacres, just, they would, uh, rape and mutilation were common murdered for sport 
It's an amazing atrocity. And nobody cared. They could get away with it forever. Bibliography once again. And here's a nice treat. We get a back cover by Kim Deitch. Arson. Just talking about how in a lot of decaying inner cities in our country, especially in the 70s, a lot of landlords were buying really crappy real estate, really cheap, doing some kind of scam where they'd sell it to their buddy, then sell it back. So it would make the insurance value seem heightened. It would make it raise. And then when it got to its max, they'd hire some local gang members probably to torch the place for the insurance money. This was very common in New York City. I know as a kid. It was in the newspaper all the time in the 70s. And of course, this guy's happy as hell. The fireman's like, sorry, we couldn't save your building. And he's like, oh, that's all right. But all the poor people who have to live in this apartment who no longer can. You know, of course, obviously they're the victims. And a lot of them, as you can imagine, died. Because um, some, some of them weren't as lucky as these guys who escaped the fire. But I just love this. It's a beautiful uh, cartooning uh, page. This devil here. Nice stuff. So there you have it. Corporate Crime Comics number one and number two. Some very educational stuff. And so relevant today, unfortunately. Um, this shit's still going on. Almost all of this stuff. Some of it's actually being done worse. So, uh... I think they had three printings each. I think these sold pretty well. So there's probably a lot of these floating out there in back issue bins. Hope you can find them. Uh, nice compilation of some classic underground cartoonists. And uh, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.